it's um, Shelley Sweeney and I'm interviewing uh, Jean Dryden. We're at the Delta Chelsea in Toronto and it's um, June 4th, uh, 2011. So uh, Jean, this is uh, an oral history project. Um, maybe you can start by telling us when and how you became an archivist. Okay. Well, like many people of my generation, I drifted into archives. Um, I started my first job at was at the then Public Archives of Canada uh, in Ottawa, and I started in 1972. I uh, was coming to that position with uh, uh, an MA in uh, Canadian Studies, specializing in Canadian history, and um, I had done uh, archival research for my master's uh, thesis at, at the Public Archives of Canada, and to know some archivists and I thought this looks really like a fun sort of job. So I, I applied for a position and got, got a position and started in 1972. And uh, did you get a master's in librarianship later? Uh, no, um, I had a BA from Queens and an MA in Canadian Studies from Carleton. I, I later um, went back to school and got my MLS from, from Western, but that was after I'd been working in archives for 10 years and decided these librarians were onto something and archivists were kind of reinventing certain librarian wheels, so I went back to school, but that was later. So um, in terms of uh, reinventing uh, the um, wheel, uh, how did you feel that that applied to the archival profession? Well, I, I worked for four years at the public archives and then I went to um, the provincial archives of Alberta and there I was in charge of visual holdings, you know, and the still photos as well as the sound and moving image stuff. And uh, I was very interested in archival description and, um, and subject indexing in particular. And uh, uh, we had done a, uh, our own in-house subject headings based on Library of Congress subject headings. But uh, as I did a bit more reading and discovered about it, um, it, it just became clear to me that there were tools and practices in librarianship that were applicable to archives, and I really want to learn more about what those tools by going to library school. Um, part, I guess an, an undercurrent of this is that, uh, and it's something that I, I can't really explain and have always wanted to explore, is the hostility and the, you know, the two solitudes between our, our archival practice and librarianship. And librarians and archivists don't talk to each other a lot. And so all this library, library stuff is kind of a mystery to me. But I need to you know, go, go over to the other side and find out what they're doing. Because a lot of it, I think, is going to be useful to us. And so you developed the, um, <coughs> the Provincial Archives of Alberta subject headers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that was after you had gone to library school? No, I did it before. Oh, you did it before. <laughs> yeah, but um, that was sort of made me realize how dumb I was about developing subject headings. That maybe I should, before I did anything else that essentially reinvented the wheel, um, maybe I should go see, see what wheels were out there. So uh, tell us a bit more then about how you uh, got involved in the um, subject headings, or, sorry, not subject headings, but um, about standards. Uh, descriptive standards in Canada. Okay, well that was, I guess that was kind of the start. And, and the other um, uh, thing I had done at the Provincial Archives of Alberta was um, their card catalog. You know, with, you know, there wasn't anything else but card catalogs in those days, um, which was the main access, means of access to their holdings, was pretty clunky and I, I can't even now, I can't now remember what was wrong with it, but I undertook a revision of, of that, and I, I know there's an article in Archivaria that I wrote about that, but I can't remember what I said. But anyway, that was that was kind of my interest, you know, in archival description. And um, when I came back from library school, because my I was very fortunate that the Provincial Archives of Alberta gave me 
gave me study leave to go back to school for a year and held my job for me and um, simply required that I work there for at least two more years to kind of pay, pay them back for, so they would get some return on their investment. Um, it was after I came back from the library school that um, Terry Eastwood and Marcel Kaya applied for the shirk money to uh, set up the working group on, you know, to fund the working group on archival descriptive standards in Canada. And I was a member of that, that group. And, um, so were they, did they choose you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think it was because of these, I, I had written a couple of articles or notes on the provincial archive subject headings and the, this, the, the revision of the main entry catalog, as we called it. And um, so I was, I think Terry had spotted me as somebody who was, had an interest in description. And so they chose me to be on the board. So um, and that's how you became involved, uh, uh, or how you developed as an archivist. Um, what, uh, how did you become involved in the archival profession uh, before the, um, your work with the descriptive standards? Oh, okay. Um, well, I was just a, a baby archivist. And I remember my in my first year at the public archives, my colleagues were talking about going to CHA because at that point there was no way CHA. Um, the archival profession in Canada was the, the, our professional association was the history, the archive section of CHA, and so the conference that year was going to be in Kingston and people were talking about going and I, it never occurred to me that my employer would actually send me to something like this because I, I was just really naive and I'd never worked before and, um, and so people would say, well, are, are you going? And I'd say, well, I, I don't think so, but I, I figured out, well, I, I said, like, how do you get to go? And it was simply a case of asking for funding and um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure it wasn't quite that easy, but anyway, I was, I went, and I, I, I was just, um, it was, it was really um, an important event for me to realize there is a profession, you know, perhaps a fledgling profession out there, but there's other folks that do what I do in different types of organizations, and they maybe do it differently, but there's a, you know, there is a, a community here that I really want to be part of. And you meet other people, and uh, I can still remember some of the people that I met at that first first meeting. Who were those? Be? And um, well, actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, I'm blanking on last names. Um, from I, I'm not even going to go there because I'm going to make a hash of it. Um, and so, of of course, and that was in. That would have been in 73. And that was also the point at which um, Marion B.A. and Dave Rudkin and Gordon Dodd started doing their cross-Canada tour to um, raise interest and test interest in whether it was time to have our own separate association. And so they met with the staff of the Public Archives of Canada. And uh, um, I, again, this professional community that was moving away from historians was, was something I wanted to be involved in. So I was um, at Edmund. I'm a founding member of this organization. I was at, in Edmonton when we set up our own association and have been a member ever since. So um, <clears throat> that was how you became involved with the Association of Canadian Archivists. Uh, tell us about some of the roles that you played. Okay, well I have uh, been the the treasurer very early on. I can't remember the years now, but um, you know, within the first five years, I served as treasurer, a two-year term as treasurer. Um, I have um, been president of '86 to '87, and before that, a year as vice vice president. Um, I have served as the you know, chair of the publications committee. Um, I am now the editor of Archivaria. I've been a member. Of other committees. Mm -hmm. I've also served as the ACA representative on various CCA bodies and on the, you know, and on the Bureau. Uh, you know, again, I was in, the, in 80, 586 when the, the CCA, the Canadian Private System, was being set up. Because 
because I was the president, I was the ACA rep to those bodies. So I, I had an opportunity to be involved in the early days of, of those organizations as well. So what was the ACA like when you first became involved as an organization? How would you characterize it? Well, we were setting things up from scratch, you know, getting a constitution, trying to establish, we still maintain that connection with historians, but yet um, emphasize our differences. And um, we, the other struggle, I guess, in terms of identifying ourselves was what was our relationship with the AAQ? which was a much more old, you know, what, not much older, but had already been established. And if we're the national organization, we have to be bilingual. And, but we're not really. And, and so in fact, the Bureau was kind of the mechanism that was established to uh, address that, that very important issue. So we were struggling a bit with the nuts and bolts of things, like getting a newsletter. You know, should we have a newsletter and about setting up a journal? And, the Constitution, should we incorporate all those kind of technical things, getting them up and running, but also there were broader issues of identity um, because a lot of our, a lot of our archivists, particularly at the National at the Public Archives, um, because there was no archival qualification, like such as a Master of Archival Studies, and because there wasn't even particular training for archivists within library schools. People came in with degrees in history. And so there was a lot of folks who were saying, but, but, but we are historians. That is what archivists should be. And so this breach with the CHA was you know, a very, it, it wasn't a problem for me. I don't, I don't recall, but the folks particularly with, the, with PhDs in history So, um, were there any people that you can think of that uh, influenced you in those early years? Well, I've always been um, very close to Terry Eastwood, mm -hmm. and um, we could, I think because of our shared interest in description, um, and we just get along, get along really well. Um, I, I do. Paul Gordon Dodds as our first president was a very eloquent and um, thoughtful and thought-provoking speaker about the profession and why, why we were, what we did was different from what historians did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, even though I, um, Gordon and I never, never worked together in the same institution, well for that matter, neither did Terry. But um, I just re I really think Gordon was a, a good first president of the organization. Um, if you have to identify some key players in uh, the archival field, uh, besides yourself, of course, <laughs> who would you uh, who would you select? <coughs> who would you point out? Well, certainly Marion B. A. Um, right from the, you know, the the vision of our own association. was a group, you may have, the Prairie Archivist group at that, mm -hmm. at that point, and we, the Prairie Archivist used to get together and have annual meetings or semi-annual meetings, and um, so I'd say Ian obviously is very influential in the, on the profession. Um, Terry Eastwood, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm probably leaving a whole bunch of people out, those are so um, what would you say the differences are between archives when you started and archives today? Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, uh, nobody drifts into archives today. Um, there is, you know, people go to graduate school and they, they know they want to be archivists. So there, 
there is training, uh, professional training, graduate level training, and that to me is simply wonderful. Um, um, I think we are very clearly an information profession, not historians more okay. mm -hmm. um, We have standards and a body of practice and a body of theory. I mean, I think we already always had that practice and theory, but it's um, far more well articulated and, now, and we've got standards and, and the practice has evolved to be, you know, I'll guess it would be, one would hope it would, to be far more sophisticated and, uh, than, than, it, than it was. Um, and just, I mean, a lot of it is due to circumstances like technology. I mean, communication is just so much so much easier instead of sending things around in the mail um, or typing up finding a like on a typewriter and the amazing advance that the IBM Selectric was with the movable ball instead of the, the you know the platen going back and forth. Um, just the technology has made it an enormous amount of difference because there's so much you know, there's so much in archives, you, you keep recording the same information and, and sort of dragging it along with you as you process a collection and as you make it available. And uh, under old technology, you retype that all the time. And now you, one hopes if your systems are sort of integrated, you just kind of bring it along with, with you and build on. So in terms of building on, do you see um, sort of layered approaches or um, in terms of description or, or do you see uh, different systems, uh, creating uh, different types of um, uh, archival description systems? Or I think we are at a... A very key... I, I'm, I'm breaking point isn't the right word. We're at a, a very key transition point, particularly in archival description, because technology we are only just beginning to get a glimmer of what technology can do. Um, and the way that uh, information, you know, representations of our collections can be repackaged and shifted around and reconfigured in different ways. Um, instead of, you know, we're coming from the situation where you know, the physical piece of paper or whatever it is can only be in one place. And so you're finding a, your, your description reflected that. But now we can manipulate the information and find the aid and combine it and link it and do all kinds of fabulous things with it in, in ways that um, some, some of the visionaries, I think, can see more clearly than I. Than I. I tend to be an A to B to C to, to D person, and other people can go from A to F bound and see what is possible, but um, I, I think it's really, we're on the brink of a very exciting time, and I'm not, I just know the possibilities are there, I can start to see some of them, and uh, I think they will only grow, but they, in, at the same time, that will be very troubling for the folks that like standards and certainty and um, clarity, because to experiment with and uh, before we settle down to what best practices are. And I, I really think, I mean, I've been also very involved in the development of descriptive standards, and a lot of our descriptive standards are hopelessly clunky. Like, I think, ugh. Um, I mean, I, I still think we need standards, but they seem pretty limiting. Possibilities the technology provides us with, I think our standards are going to have to change also in that people hate changing, having to change their stuff because the standard changes. So um, can I just ask, uh, what has the ACA meant to you? Um, the ACA has been really important to me in my career. I, um, even though I've done different things in my career and wear different hats and you know, I'm now an academic and you know, kids keep going back to school and setting up so 
consulting business, and I'm no longer actually a practicing archivist, but um, I've, it's just been really important to me to be a member of the ACA and to make a contribution to it through, you know, throughout my profession, I think, or throughout my career. I think um, professional associations are only as strong as those who serve them, and I think it's it's a professional's duty to serve in various ways. So I, as I mentioned, been, been the treasurer, and then I've been the president, and I'm now the editor of Mark Berry, and I've been the copyright committee chair, and I, um, I, I like to think I've made a significant contribution over the years to to improve the profession, grow the profession, support young people as they enter the profession, and uh, I, it's not over yet. So are there anything, uh, any activities that the ACA does that um, particularly stand out in your mind? Well, obviously, um, Archivaria, I mean, I, I, can, I, I have been the editor for all one issue, so I, I, I can hardly claim credit for that, but I, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and, and, and to mix metaphors hopelessly, uh, there are big shoes to fill, and I, I, I must say I do feel the the pressure, particularly since, as you know, last year the Australian Research Council gave us an A plus, gave the journal an A plus rating, and wow, that's really fabulous. So I think the journal, um, and I guess the the fellowship um, and the traditions we've established, like you, um, just at this point as I'm transitioning from the USA back to to Canada, I'm thinking how comfortable this conference is, and there are things that happen at this conference that don't happen at the SAA, like nobody's going to be talking hockey or any other sport for World Series, or I mean, it doesn't have to be hockey, but, and, and there's no dance, and there's no baseball game, and um, those are traditions that are ours, and um, we, I think we all value them. So, and I, I value the the association and the you know, relationships I've established with people, both they are, they are my professional colleagues, but many of them are also my friends. And about the ACA and the conferences and the committees and the hours waiting in airports and, you know, all, all the stuff that builds friendships and builds um, community. Just to hold on, I, okay. um, 